Thank you, Light Talk speakers. I love hearing about inclusive degree channel and farmer led digital innovation. At this time, I am honored to announce our next panel of presenters from the University of Columbia. High School for Her Community, join welcome. Hadibon Adesogo, Charlie Lee, Geoffrey Dow, and Colonel Mulali. The floor is yours. share this presentation with you today from the Global Food Systems Institute. My name is Bola Deshogwan, I'm the director, and I'm here with my colleagues who are experts uh, in this area. The university was granted the fastest supercomputer in higher education, and the university hired about 100 new professors. And Dr. Charlie Lee, our first speaker, is the administrative lead uh, for AI in the College of Agriculture, and he'll talk to us about harnessing AI to meet sustainable development goals in low and middle income countries. And then the other two talks will be from our Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems, which is working in five countries to improve food security, livelihoods, um, using animal source foods. And the director, Dr. Jerk Dahl, will give the first talk, uh, followed by the lead for our marketing, innovation, and translation area of inquiry. So I'm going to turn it over to Charlie Lee to give the first talk, and we'll go on from there. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to co present this uh, keynote uh, with uh, my colleagues. So, in the next few minutes, I want to um, talk about the impact of AI on the global agriculture and food systems and on the sustainable development goals at low and uh, middle income countries. First, let me provide a brief history of AI. The birth of AI can be traced back to 1950 with the introduction of Turing test. The term artificial intelligence was coined in the first AI conference in 1955. The maturation of AI began in 1960s with the first industrial robot, chatbot, and uh, the expert system developed in the following years. Despite its ups and downs uh, in 70s to 90s, some exciting research progress was made in AI. For example, the invention of back propagation for neural networks and uh, IBM's Deep Blue defeating the world chess champion, and uh, Lynet, a neural network to recognize handwritten digits in 1990s. So in 2005, DARPA's grand challenge marked the beginning of autonomous driving. In 2012, uh, with the help of ImageNet, a large scale uh, database with millions of labeled images helped researchers develop the first deep neural network, AlexNet, which ushered the beginning of the deep learning. In the next 10 years or so, we have witnessed exciting progress in deep learning. For example, generative AI, such as uh, GANs, and uh, remarkable uh, research progress from DeepMind's AlphaGo, defeating world champion in the most complicated game, Go, as well as AlphaFold, and the GPT, chat GPT. So let's take a look of the state of art of AI today. As I mentioned, the chat GPT was released last, no last November. It is just one of the many large language models, uh, which are trained by vast amount of data with uh, billions of parameters. And those uh, large language models can understand and uh, generate natural language. And those multi-modality models nowadays can not only uh, take input of text, but also uh, different types of input such as audio and images, and they can generate uh, uh, remarkable images or uh, whatever uh, modalities with remarkable accuracy and detail. For example, uh, generative AI models such as uh, DAO E3 and Middle Journey can generate those uh, very um, um, detailed images. In robotics, OpenAI Dactyl um, 
platform basically can leverage um, reinforcement learning and a robotic, robotic hand to perform dexterous manipulation of physical objects. In autonomous driving, companies like uh, Tesla and uh, Waymo build uh, sophisticated deep neural networks for um, vehicles to navigate the real world autonomously, leading to a future of uh, intelligent transportation. In scientific discovery, uh, tools like uh, AlphaFold 2 can revolutionize our understanding of uh, 3D structure of protein, uh, which opens the new avenues for medical breakthroughs. So AI can also transform agriculture and food systems. Indeed, Agriculture 4.0 is largely driven by technologies such as robotics, IoT, big data, and cloud computing and AI. So AI can help us build a secure, resilient food chain. For example, precision breeding and phenomics to help breed plant animals with a higher yield, better quality, and resistance to climate change and stresses. Precision agriculture to leverage those technologies uh, to minimize farmers' input and maximize their uh, productivity. Crop monitoring and disease detection to detect diseases in early stage and uh, reduce application of uh, chemicals and save farmers uh, money and maximize their uh, profit. Robotic farming um, uses uh, robots and automation to address labor costs and the shortage issues <coughs> in tasks such as uh, weeding, scouting, and the harvesting of specialty crops. Food quality sensing leverages AI and the sensing technologies to, uh, to uh, ensure we have a safe and high quality food for consumers and to reduce post-harvest losses. Those videos and uh, images highlight some of the work conducted in my lab as well as by other researchers in the nation. So a few large companies actually are leading the way of leveraging AI and digital tools to transform agricultural food systems. For example, Climate Corporation provides those uh, digital tools and uh, decision-making tools uh, for farmers. For example, the field view is a such kind of a tool that can uh, leverage the big data uh, to help farmers make uh, informed decisions to maximize their profitability. And the Blue River technology now owned by John Deere leverages AI and uh, robotics and uh, computer vision to selectively thin letters, uh, therefore to reduce chemical application and also maximize their crop production performance. The Farm Beats project by Microsoft leverages AI and uh, IoT devices to collect and analyze the farm data in real time and provide the data for farmers to make informed decisions. Google's mineral project uses uh, the data collected by the robot in the farm, as well as the uh, data from the satellites to help farmers grow their crops at scale. AI could also be a game changer in agriculture for developing countries. For example, AI tools and algorithms can increase crop product productivity by predicting the planting and harvesting dates and uh, optimize the productivity. AI algorithms can promote sustainable farming practices, uh, basically uh, to conserve resources using AI uh, algorithms. Um, the AI and the digital tools can increase profitability by predicting the market trend and the demand. So that will enable farmers to make their informed decision to maximize their profit. Uh, AI tools can also reduce environmental impacts. For example, those uh, precision technologies can monitor the health of plants and animals and uh, soil conditions. Therefore, they can reduce the input of uh, pesticides, herbicide, and uh, excessive water. On the right, you can see some real world examples uh, in developing countries using AI and digital tools. The Africa Agriculture Watch is an AI-based uh, web application that can um, uh, leverage the data uh, sources and provide uh, um, actionable insights 
for Africa food production. On the right, Afri Scout is an AI based mobile app uh, for shepherds and uh, cattle farmers. They can use this tool and you know, aerial images to optimize the grazing pattern, manage their pastures, and uh, maximize their life, livestock productivity. At lower uh, left corner, that's a project sponsored by Google, which uses the satellite images to provide a comprehensive landscape, landscape understanding uh, for Indian farmers. So this will be crucial to uh, managing and leveraging the vast amount of data in India. At the lower right corner, that's a, an example called a farmer.chat. It's a chatbot which can provide a kind of a expert knowledge and advice to farmers to help them make informed decisions. So AI could have a profound impact on UN's sustainable development goals. One study reported that uh, uh, AI could have uh, overall 79% positive impact on the 17 uh, SDGs and related 169 targets. Those researchers broadly categorized those uh, 169 targets into three categories, namely environment, society, and economy, color-coded in these two circular graphs. On the left, you can see specifically on environment, actually AI could have the uh, most positive impact with a 93% uh, impact on those targets. Um, this, uh, these <coughs> benefits are mainly from uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, AI-based uh, climate modeling and uh, optimized resource management. But uh, on environment, AI could also have 30% negative impact, or we call it inhibitor, for those 30% uh, targets. This is mainly because of AI could uh, lead to over-exploitation of resources. On society, AI could have 82% positive impact on, I think, nine of those 17 SDGs, mainly through uh, kind of uh, uh, enhanced productivity, social services, um, and productivity, uh, but uh, AI could also have 38% negative impact if you look at the, uh, the right graph on society-related uh, uh, SDGs. This is mainly because of uh, um, uh, social uh, inequality and bias against the minority and the women. So on economy, uh, AI could uh, have 70% positive impact on five of, uh, of those SDGs, but also 33% negative impact. Those positive impact could come from uh, enhanced economic performance and productivity, but the negative impact could come from the high energy cost and, uh, and the inequality caused by AI because AI uh, disproportionately benefit those educated while uh, penalizes those uh, less educated. So um, we need to be cautious about AI's uh, uh, effect on SDGs, and we need to put uh, oversight and regulation on AI-based technologies to maximize its positive impact and minimize its uh, negative impact. Failure to do so could lead to gaps in um, transparency, safety, and uh, ethical standards. In the end, I want to highlight a few uh, examples of uh, research conducted by University of Florida researchers using AI and digital tools for agriculture. Examples include uh, AgroView, a uh, crop management system leveraging aerial imagery and AI to predict yield and uh, crop health. A uh, AI-based mobile app to classify identification of leaf diseases in citrus to prevent uh, HLB disease in citrus. A computer vision and deep learning based uh, web app for like precision livestock management. And also an example of uh, using um, animal mobi mobility analysis from videos using AI to analyze, to analyze the, the uh, livestock movement and improve their health. 
Another example is uh, to use deep learning models to classify and uh, detect weights for precision spraying. And another example is a robot equipped with the computer vision and AI for peanut yield estimation. Those are just a few examples. And uh, next, I want to invite my colleagues to present their innovative work. Thank you, Charlie. Thank the organizers for the invitation. I wanted to go through uh, one of the digital tools that we've developed to uh, aid uh, dairy farmers around the world. The Livestock Systems Innovation Lab works in five different countries and across the board, those countries are interested in increasing their uh, dairy productivity, uh, mostly from cattle, but also from small ruminants. So this is just one example of a digital tool that we've developed to assist uh, with that endeavor. Uh, this is particular for Rwanda and uh, we have put together a farm assessment tool combined with a ration balancing tool, uh, both in English and in Kiryawanda, so that they can use this as a uh, tool to improve productivity at the farm level. So just to give you the sort of upfront information, this is what the tool appears like. It is available on the Google Play Store and can be downloaded. Uh, we are currently getting uh, it on the Apple uh, Store as well. Uh, this is meant to be used uh, on multiple sites. It's also meant to be used across time in order to look at uh, ways to improve productivity and improve management of animals. So it's not a static uh, sort of report. We envision it as being used on a probably a, a every six to 12 month basis to look for improvements across time. There are a number of areas that we look at in this, uh, as you might expect, milking routine is one of the ones that we're interested in. And you see here two screenshots. Uh, the before is when we start uh, answering questions around uh, milking routine issues. You can see that there is a, a small um, radio uh, dial there uh, in the general area that comes up as 0% and hygiene also because nothing has been answered yet. And then once the tool has been used and questions have been answered, then you start to see those fill in. And some of the questions are, are around the idea of improvements in um, hygiene and also improvements in the overall milking routine to increase productivity, improve utter health in the animals, and also to uh, increase or improve the quality of the milk. We don't have just an assessment. It is also an educational tool, so you can see that there is a range of responses there with some tips for improvement and how uh, producers can move from a, a lower rating to a, a higher rating across time. We also look at milk harvest, um, the uh, efficiency of milk uh, harvesting and also uh, milking uh, procedures that are going to lead to improved utter health, uh, both for the uh, improved productivity that comes with improved utter health, but also again, the improvement in milk quality uh, as well. In the end, after this series of questions have been answered, there'll be a summary report generated uh, for each of the areas of management that we're interested in addressing. You see here we have sort of a web diagram uh, that shows the, the general uh, activity or, or improvement uh, options uh, in each of the farm assessment areas. And so we go through milking procedures, we go through record keeping, management, housing, all of these uh, can then be uh, downloaded in a summary report and used as, again, a, a benchmark uh, for sort of a longitudinal approach to improvement across these areas of animal management. We've combined this a farm assessment tool with uh, a ration formulation tool. We find that in many of the countries we work in, um, improvements can be made without significant changes in total resource inputs 
by just doing a better job of combining ingredients and uh, looking at uh, ingredient uh, availability across time. In many areas, we have dry and, and rainy seasons, um, and we have really tried to emphasize improvements in not just forage uh, quality, but also forage storage so that we can have a more uh, continuous availability of, of feed for animals. That then needs to be combined with uh, concentrates and, and other byproducts that might be available uh, to produce a ration that is uh, of the highest value. So just to give you details, we have, uh, again, simple, simple sort of questions as to what animals are, are being fed, what the ration is being developed for, and then what feeds might be available to that producer. They can go in and select from a, uh, a group of feeds that are specific to the country uh, that they were working in, and this can be changed uh, up for different countries in order to reflect <clears throat> what might be available locally uh, rather than looking at a more or global uh, sort of approach. Once the different ingredients available have been uh, identified, they can then select uh, for what they might want to use and actually uh, what would be available in the area, not just for forages, but also for byproducts and, and concentrates, including uh, mineral and vitamin supplements that may be necessary to produce uh, an appropriate ration. And then there'll be an assessment in the end uh, for rations that are developed, uh, looking at whether it is actually meeting the needs for that particular group of animals. They might be growing heifers, they could be lactating cows, they could be cows late in gestation when they're not lactating. All of those animals are going to have different needs uh, across the sort of macronutrient level, protein, uh, energy, uh, but they're also going to have different micronutrient needs as well. And so the ration is assessed and if there is a limitation that's identified with uh, indicators for how that can be resolved. So this Zerocomwa app is, uh, uh, we think, uh, effective, an effective tool for improvement in productivity in the dairy uh, space uh, within Rwanda. We have also used it in a number of other countries. It provides a framework for uh, development in other local situations. Um, the Data entry, uh, these are points of high impact, but relatively easy to, to uh, address. Uh, the ration balancing and the management uh, essentially combines the two most important aspects of improvements in, in, in dairy productivity, which would be related to management and also nutrition. It's not just an assessment tool. There are uh, educational tips uh, that uh, can be uh, highlighted and folks can go and look for more information on how they can improve the overall management and nutrition for their animals. It provides simple messaging within the summary report and visuals so that uh, areas for improvement can be easily identified and then we have, uh, it's intended for use uh, in a longitudinal manner so that improvements can be made across time. And as I mentioned, it is adaptable to other countries and languages. And in fact, we have done that uh, across um, other countries that we work in, both in the Livestock Systems Innovation Lab and other projects uh, here at the University of Florida. So now I'll turn it over to Connor Mullally to talk about another digital tool. Thanks, Jeff. So for the past five or six years or so, I, along with researchers at the University of Illinois, Colorado State University, University of California Davis, and interdisciplinary analysts in Nepal have been collaborating with Heifer International's office in Nepal to develop and evaluate uh, mobile, mobile apps uh, to improve the performance of the small scale uh, livestock producers in Nepal. Just to set a little bit of the context, as we know, uh, small producers, not just livestock producers, but this would also apply to crop producers, they can struggle to access high value markets. Uh, for example, the buyers who, who purchase for high value markets might uh, prefer to buy in bulk and 
uh, small scale producers can't provide the volumes that are needed and it might be too costly for large buyers to work with a large number of uh, small scale producers. And they also can struggle to access uh, input markets such as uh, animal health services. Cooperatives can uh, alleviate some of the constraints that affect uh, the ability of small scale producers to access output markets and, and uh, animal health services, but that doesn't eliminate the coordination problem, right? So you've basically moved the coordination problem from buyers to the cooperatives and it's now the responsibility of the cooperative to uh, coordinate their members to participate in collective sales and coordinate so other members so they can access act, they can access services like uh, animal health care. Uh, for marketing, uh, coordination of uh, collective sales is going to hinge in large part on uh, being able to uh, compile data on what members have for sale and also to um, make it clear to members when collective uh, sales events are, are taking place, and that's uh, easier said than done if you don't have the right tools for the job. Um, same thing for animal health care. So uh, cooperatives can make it easier for animal health professionals to provide their services by, for example, assembling cooperative members in one place at a given time to receive, to receive animal health care services. Uh, but even if you do that, uh, oftentimes uh, the quality of care from uh, service providers in rural areas of low-income countries can be poor. So I, along with my collaborators, have worked on uh, developing digital tools to address the problems uh, discussed on the previous slide. Uh, the first tool is a marketing tool. It's known as the Virtual Collection Center. And what this tool is, is it's an Android app that makes it possible for uh, cooperatives in a decentralized manner to collect uh, data on the animals that their members have for sale, which are goats in the particular case that we're looking at, and also uh, boost participation in collective sales just by uh, making their members aware of when sales are taking place, uh, when, uh, what exactly traders want who are participating in those sales, and uh, targeting that information appropriately using the information, the inventory data that were collected, basically knowing who has animals for sale and would be willing to sell them at uh, prevailing prices. Um, <clears throat> since using this tool entails some work on the part of the cooperative, uh, it's typically in the hands of a, uh, a person who's in charge of data collection who receives uh, incentives for uh, collecting the inventory information and also helping to coordinate um, collective sales. So here are some screenshots of the interface from the Virtual Collection Center app. These shots are in English, but as you might expect, when it's used in Nepal, the interface is in Nepali. So it's a fairly simple tool, and that's by design, because we don't want to overwhelm people with uh, different options. Uh, uh, individuals who are managing the app have the ability to um, uh, uh, edits the, the rosters of SHG, which stands for self-help groups. These are subgroups within the cooperatives, uh, communicate with members of the self-help groups, uh, coordinate sales and with uh, a cooperative officer who uh, is ultimately in charge of uh, negotiating sales with traders, um, collecting uh, inventory data and inventory are disaggregated based on the characteristics that uh, traders would um, emphasize as being important when um, setting up sales. Um, this tool is deployed uh, by various data collectors uh, throughout cooperatives who then you know, go to uh, clusters of cooperative members, collect inventory data, transmit it back to uh, a cooperative officer who has a separate version of the app that they can use on a smartphone or a tablet, or if they prefer, use a desktop uh, computer application that where they uh, manage the data, use that information to negotiate with traders, uh, set up sales, and then invite uh, members of the cooperatives to, to sales, sales events, that is. So uh, we are currently running a pilot of a new and improved version of the Virtual uh, Collection Center with uh, nine cooperatives in Nepal. Uh, the peak marketing season for goats in Nepal is around September or October, uh, creeping into November during the, the festival season. And during that time, uh, about 1,400 goats have been uh, compiled uh, in inventory data that were collected through the app, and around half of those have been sold through uh, marketing events that were uh, set up through the app as well. Uh, this is a pilot. Uh, things look 
good so far, but obviously, you know, we have no control group, so this doesn't tell us anything about uh, causality with respect to the effects of the app. To address those kinds of questions, our plan is to do a randomized control trial with 150 cooperatives um, next year. So the next tool uh, is targeted at uh, animal health care um, providers. Um, we are uh, building on a pre-existing technology to create a digital mentoring and continuing education platform for community animal health workers. If you're not familiar with community animal health workers or CAUSE, they are para-veterinarians who provide basic animal health care like deworming, injections, castration, that kind of thing. Um, the, the, the platform is based on Android tablets and it delivers information about different uh, types of animal health care, uh, basically kind of starting at the bottom and working uh, up to more complex topics. And it also connects the cause to, to mentors. So within the platform, you have a list of uh, experts who are kind of higher up in the animal health care hierarchy, um, and you can connect with them to uh, ask them questions about uh, whatever topic an individual cause might have. Uh, the alternative way for community animal health workers to build their skills in place of uh, the, ma the major alternative way to, to, to build skills other than through this platform is by uh, taking um, classes at a training center. Uh, that might be possible for uh, men to do, but in the Nepali context, it can be very difficult for women. And a lot of these cause are, are women, just household responsibilities might make it impossible to uh, participate in an extended stay at a training center. Um, the, the platform that we're developing uh, makes it possible to access uh, professional development skills, uh, skills building without the need to uh, leave the community. So as I mentioned, this platform builds on an existing technology and the original technology was a, a, a tablet-based training system designed to create new community animal health workers, so train people so that they could become certified to work as a community animal health worker rather than building the skills of existing community animal health workers. Uh, that tool was rolled out uh, a few years ago. We evaluated it using uh, a randomized experiment with 300 women who are members of the same cooperatives that we've been working with uh, throughout this, the, these years with, uh, with Heifer International in Nepal. Uh, the experiment included 300 women. Basically, we had a, a randomly selected control group, a randomly selected uh, group of women who were invited to participate in classroom-based training to become a community animal health worker, which requires a 35-day stay at a training center, or uh, another group of women who was randomly selected to be invited to do uh, tablet-based training it still included the classroom uh, component, but that co the time needed in the classroom was greatly reduced by virtue of using these tablets in the home. And getting invited to the hybrid uh, plat uh, distance tablet-based training had a dramatic impact on training completion among women, despite the fact that these were women who were vetted by their cooperatives as being good candidates for training. So uh, they were already kind of initially uh, selected by their cooperatives and from that group we randomly picked women to get by different types of training and being offered the tablet-based training still had a dramatic impact even among those hand-picked candidates on how likely they were to complete their training. Um, what we want to do is build on that tool to see if we can go beyond creating new cause and build the skills of existing cause to allow them to do more, allow them to maintain their skills, perhaps reduce the rate of attrition from uh, this profession, and some might even be able to go higher in the animal health care hierarchy and boost uh, their income. Uh, this new technology will also be evaluated using a randomized control trial at, in 2024 using around 300 to 400 community animal health workers. And here are some screenshots from the existing uh, training platform, tablet-based training pl platform for the community animal health workers. Uh, basically, individuals using the platform can go through, learn about different topics, and use self-assessment tools to test their knowledge, um, whereas the traditional curriculum is strictly based on you know, printed material. Putting things on a tablet allows the in introduction of different media and different sorts of tools to give feedback to the individuals who are using uh, the, the platform, and as I noted, we're going to add on the ability to engage with experts through uh, the platform. 
when it is rolled out. Thank you. Thank you very much. There you have it, uh, a talk on harnessing AI for the SDGs and then also the digital tools that were developed by the Livestock Systems Innovation Lab. So we'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Paul Panel. Uh, so we have a couple of questions uh, for you. Uh, yeah, um, and straight to the point. So I had uh, Adebola uh, mentioned this work is supported by USAID, uh, Feed the Future Innovation Lab. For the audience not familiar with the Innovation Lab, can you tell us a little bit more about it, how it works, and what kind of institutions participate? Sure. Uh, so this is a project that has been going for about eight years now. Uh, it is, as you said, funded by USAID. And we work in five countries at this point. We work in six originally, but uh, we have, uh, with our renewal, gone down to, to five countries. We are the management entity for this, and our purpose is really to improve access to animal source foods among the most vulnerable groups in countries with very high rates of, of stunting. And so those audiences that we're really trying to improve access to those animal source foods in are pregnant, lactating women and children under two, because that's where we see the, the most improvements uh, possible in terms of, of increasing uh, animal source food consumption and effects on reducing both uh, physical and, and cognitive stunting. As the management entity, we uh, make calls for projects within the countries that we work in. Uh, the uh, projects are all a partnership of an in-country uh, organization, uh, an NGO, universities, other organizations, and uh, an external partner, um, typically a US or European-based uh, uh, institution that works with the in-country partner to develop projects around uh, various uh, improvements in, in animal productivity, animal health, uh, messaging about nutrition and the uh, importance of animal source food in, in the diet. All right, thank you so much, Dao. Um, so the next question, which uh, does, one of our keynote speaker mentioned the challenges of limited quality AI training data and algorithms available in the Global South especially collected from smallholder farms. How can we ensure AI tools developed in the global north, say Florida, still generate reliable predictions in the global south? Okay, maybe I can address that. Yeah, I think that's a um, very good question. Um, currently, most of those uh, AI models are trained using data, perhaps, as you said, in the global north. And that could uh, lead to a bias, right? If we apply the model to the global south, um, to address that issue, I think uh, first we, we we need to be mindful of this potential bias in AI models. So when we uh, uh, you know assemble our training data, perhaps we we, we need to be uh, mindful to also include uh, uh, adequate data from the global south to represent minorities and women. So, so, and that's one thing, you know, in, in data preparation and also in algorithms, I think uh, we need to fine tune the algorithm um, to perhaps give more weight uh, for this less represented uh, data uh, and, um, you know, less weight on this uh, well represented data. So I think there are, there are different ways, uh, but this is an active research area in terms of uh, addressing the bias in AI models. All right, thank you so much, Charlie. Uh, just a follow up, uh, would there be an opportunity to collaborate with institutions in the Global South, for example, uh, Nigeria, for where I am, um, to fit test your AI applications? Yeah, of course, for me, I'm, I personally, I'm very interested in this kind of collaboration opportunities. Like, yeah, so uh, welcome to contact me, you know, I, I'm very interested in those opportunities. Awesome, awesome. We're happy to hear that. And, um, so uh, still directed to Charlie, uh, 
says Charlie showed many pioneering companies um, around the world leading the development of AI technologies. And I couldn't help noticing that most of them are in the US. They are based in the US. Many of our ICT for high community members are working in developing countries. And we have this and we have discussed the import importance of using open source technologies as they are often seen as a more accessible and affordable as they are more accessible and affordable are there similar ai development happening in the open source communities so your uh, are your questions uh, whether there are some uh, open source development in the community to benefit the global south oh. Open source communities, yeah, because of their yeah. affordability and accessibility. Yeah, I think uh, right now the uh, AI community, deep learning community, most of those development uh, have uh, open source support. Uh, if, for example, um, uh, those uh, large language models, I know uh, for open AI, their models are not open. Uh, but for some other large language models, uh, uh, for example, Llama, and also uh, another model called the Lava, and those actually are open source, and uh, researchers can you know download for free. They can contribute it to the community. Yeah, some models certainly are open sourced, although some are closed. There are opportunities to contribute and uh, leverage those open source uh, um, data and the model. Awesome! Thank you so much. So I I have this personal question um, for any of you. Uh, can drone technology be used with AI or with without AI uh, to, um, for livestock management um, for the smallholder farmers? How can it be used? Well, I, I certainly think so. We're uh, starting a project to look at applications of precision technology in smallholder farmers. And so I think that the information that we gain from that study is going to be helpful to look at potential AI applications that can feed into improvements with the precision uh, approaches that we're taking. For example, one of the things we're interested in is uh, monitoring of animals for estrus. Many of our zero grazing animals are not in a position to express normal uh, estrus, and yet we know that reproductive performance is one of the sort of foundational issues uh, relative to improved productivity. So hopefully the information that we gain from the project around precision uh, technologies to detect estrus can then be used in a larger sense to make predictions about uh, reproductive performance and, and management approaches that would help to, to fine tune and improve uh, the, the use of that system. Thank you there so are, much. Uh, okay. I was also going to say there are also opportunities to use drones fitted with uh, cameras with hyperspectral imaging to look at things like differences in forage type, forage quality, forage yields that can be used to improve livestock production um, and even identify best options for optimizing livestock production even in, in developing countries. Yeah, I also think uh, uh, drone-based technologies need to use AI and machine learning tools to uh, maximize its impact because the drones can collect uh, those data, but you need to use uh, machine learning, deep learning methods to make sense, understand the images, for example, detect animals and analyze the animal behavior or forage types, uh, also make uh, decisions um, that the decision-making process you may use reinforcement learning and other machine learning models. Thank you so much uh, for all of your responses. That was actually personal because I myself, I actually lead an agri-tech startup in Nigeria that we use leveraging drone technology and data analytics to actually help and empower farmers to farm smarter, better, and more profitably. And I'm actually delighted to hear different ideas about how drone technology can be integrated with artificial intelligence to actually make the lives of smallholder farmers better down in the global south. So it's actually impressive to actually see how AI-based applications are being developed uh, to help livestock farmers. So at this point, uh, we will bring this section to a wrap and um, I would be handing over to my colleague, Jao, over to you.